thinking of the equal state because it's the most equal state. Welcome everyone to our Thursday night live. Uh, I know that we're um, doing this on a few other platforms again tonight. We are on our YouTube if you're here on Plowman's Backyard as well as Denby View Ranch. Um, they have it on their YouTube as well as their live. So if you're on any three of these platforms, welcome. Tonight's going to be a really interesting topic. Um, how to profit uh, from the homestead. And this is going to be a topic mainly Rob is going to be talking about. He's he's kind of the numbers guy. And he's done a lot of in-depth kind of on the figures of kind of the profit that you're bringing in from your actual homestead. So we're just going to hand this over to Rob and he's going to kind of educate us tonight. Uh, hi, guys. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Jenny's going to be in and out. She's going to be wrangling kids and dogs when... Our dog brought us a, a bone right away, the loudest one he could find. So um, anyway, Jenny and me went over these numbers a few months back, and then I kind of redid them today. Some things have changed, um, but we were talking talking a lot about this uh, previously, and the homestead brings in different types of value um, and profit. So uh, today I was down in the grocery store. And Kendra and me shared, uh, you know, stories about experiences we've seen lately where you've seen food costs skyr or skyrocketing, I'm sure, as well as us. Um, you know, in my instance today, the shelves were pretty bare. Um, butter is crazy. That's, I think. Yeah, the, just, we were talking maybe in a couple months, the prices really shot up for butter. Absolutely wild. You know, we were talking what it was go on sale for a couple bucks. Yeah, like you get on sale for two bucks. Now you're lucky if you get it on sale for five. <laughs> And today I went looking for uh, substitutes for Jenny um, so that she could make her own butter. And all of those were sold out in the store. So obviously people wow. are on, on the same, couldn't find 35% cream anywhere. So, wow. um, you know, and, and while I was in the store, we seen people, um, you know, making life decisions, we'll call it. Like people taking one thing in their cart, putting it back, as Kendra has described in, hers, uh, in her experiences as well. I mean, it's scary to see how high things have gotten and where they're going to stop, we don't know. Yeah. And I think that's, for us, one of the things that's such a blessing being um, on a homestead or living in the country is the ability to kind of keep your costs down um, on the rising prices of groceries, whether that be through the use of a garden or in our experience and the numbers we'll talk about, which is adding in um, livestock in the form of chicken, um, egg layers, or running uh, running cattle and pigs. Um, and we've been doing this now, uh, this is going on our third year, and I'm pretty good with figuring the numbers out um, and tracking our expenses so we know roughly what we're into for feed. Now keep in mind, I, I guess, before we go through it, every area has different expenses feed costs change from area to area and year to year so the last couple of years grain has been a little higher when we first started jenny's in the bracket on help me here a feed tote was 150 bucks 170 or something 180. yeah 180 for a feed tote it's now close to 250 these days mm -hmm. um so a tote being uh 500 kilograms so that's a drastic increase as well but some areas of the country might be more, might be less. Um, I guess we can start with, see who, what, what animals do you want us to talk about first? What animals, uh, you know, you, you think would be the, the Maybe best Maybe go one? from like the least profitable and the end with the most profitable. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Jetty's laughing in the background. Egg layers. Egg layers. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so egg layers um, for us definitely, definitely would be the least profitable. And that's the reason why we don't have them. Um, I know that they're an excellent source of eggs if you eat a lot of eggs. Our family does not. So they're not profitable for us in that way, nor do we see them being profitable to the same degree as some of our other livestock um, in like a sales way or a money profit way. Okay. So for us, we worked the numbers out. I confirmed them with Kendra because we haven't had egg layers in a while. Um, we just do meat birds. Using um, our feed numbers based off the internet and then confirming with Kendra on what a regular egg layer eats, my numbers came in pretty close to what her chickens are going through a week. Mm -hmm. I did this pricing um, two different ways. Kendra confirmed it with the bag price of feed, so a 50-pound sack of feed. Mm -hmm. And we do it um, in bulk, so through totes. So a tote, you can pick it up at your local feed mill. Um, for us, we, we get it through the same place we always do, which is um, Bark uh, Barkley Dicks, which is down in Douglas. Um, and our feed totes are 500 kilograms, which is... Uh, you no, know, it's, it's half a ton, right? Roughly 1,200 pounds of feed. And you get a much bigger discount on that. So for us, the uh, the feed cost per chicken per year, you're looking at $91.25. Um, and your, your, uh, your, your feed, like that's the amount of feed it eats. And the number of chickens that I did the number scenario on is 12. So 12 chickens, 91 pounds of feed each. You're going to need roughly two totes to cover that. When we figured out feed losses and confirming with Kendra in the bag form, chickens waste a bit. Um, yeah, they do. And and that's just something with every animal. But chickens are notorious for it um, in our experience, just kind of picking what they want and leaving the rest. So you're going to take home, uh, you're going to take home a five hundred and fifty dollar roughly feed cost for twelve layers per year. Now, what you're going to get out of those egg layers, on average, we, we guessed the uh, barnyard mixes roughly 240 eggs per year per bird, provided you've got no issues, right? Yeah. Which the chicken community probably knows now if you're in it. Um, Jenny's all over it on TikTok and seeing um, some of our, our customers that buy feed from us, um, they're having issues with their egg layers have stopped laying. Um, and then they switched our feed or local feed mills and they're coming back. But people have lost on an average two to three months where their chickens haven't laid. Yeah. So you just go 250 or 240 eggs per year. It's roughly 20 dozen eggs you're going to get per chicken. It wow. sounds like a lot. Eh? That does sound like a lot. Like you guys raise them so you'd know, but <laughs> what do you do with all those eggs? <laughs> we do have lots of eggs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you go the sales figures to sell your eggs, let's say, because in Ontario here, you could sell it farm to gate sales or at a farmer's market, but you're not allowed to take it um, and sell it, you know, direct to grocery store without going through the system of blah, blah, blah. So let's say you do good farm to gate sales. You got great customers. And I think your chickens and eggs should be $5 a dozen. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what a farm raised eggs worth to me. Yeah. I, I would buy it for five dollars a dozen. That's what mine are right now. There you go. Five that's a dozen. And, and I'm and I the think, thing is, like, we start it with three, and then went up to four, and now we're at five. And it's like you can't go any less than that, or you're no. losing. Well, your time is something we'll talk about here. That it's a lot of yeah. time involved, and you don't get paid for that as a farmer most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, chicken feed costs again. We talked five fifty for twelve um, twelve hens. We'll say. They lay all year for you, so you get 240 um, eggs per chicken um, per per year. So you sell all of those 20 dozen eggs that you get per chicken. You're going to get a total of roughly $1,200 in money coming in. Your feed expenses are 550, so you're going to end up with $650 in profit. Now that's where Kendra's talked about. Well, there's other stuff you have to do. Yeah. So you've got but your costs as well. I'll let you speak to those, like things over and above that. So come that's out of not that. even including, like I buy shavings for um, my bedding. So that's, you're looking at $8 a bag for shavings. Yep. And I usually buy about four bags, you know, anywhere, like could be six times a year, or could be four times a year, depending on my needs. Yep. That's not including that. So that's adding like another 200 
fifty to three hundred dollars yep. per year in my cost, which then brings my profit down to three something. Three something, and, and then, then got... if there's any diseases, if you need any ivermectin, if you need um maybe some electrolytes or vitamin yeah. water or sometimes bronchial spray if you've got like um, mites or something like that or other things, you're then dropping that cost down. So Even it, further, yeah. it depends. It, it could vary. And even yeah. though it might not really bring in a lot, the nice thing that I do like about having the chickens, I will say, is that there's always the egg source. Like we've always got that. Yeah. If nothing else we've got that um we have a protein source there um the other thing is um we don't need to buy our chickens every year that's it so yeah. we, we might be losing money in in a sense that way and looking at profit because um depending on the year and anything disease wise happening or you lose a whole flock but the sustainability of having chickens to me outweighs that that fear factor of, you know, I can't go to the grocery store and yep. buy these certain things. I do have a source there for yep. food for the family. That's what I think is really good about running the numbers like that is the basic costs. Let's say you had to go out and buy um, 20 dozen eggs a year <laughs> or whatever else. Well, that's going to cost you a significant amount. But if you can raise that for yourself, mm -hmm. you may not be exactly saving money or profiting from those chickens. Yeah. but you're eating a healthier source and you're not yeah. worried about yeah. getting that source of protein. It's there. The eggs are there yeah. and you don't have to go to the grocery store or find funding for it or whatever else, your credit card, whatever else. It's yours. You know where you have it. And that's mm -hmm. invaluable to, to a, for me, as long as I can cover the feed costs and when it comes to selling the eggs, I'm happy, you know, cause I enjoy yeah. having them, yeah. but it does cost money to have chickens and to feed them. <laughs> yeah. That's right, yeah. So you talk about the lifespan of Yeah, so lifespan. Because you have to replenish. Yeah. I'm only doing it on a per year basis for the main major profit, but obviously none of these chickens are infinite. You get, what, four good years out of them usually? Four or five? Yeah, so like with the traditional kind of commercial egg layer, I think we've talked about it on other lives. We have, yeah. Um, you're looking at a good three, maximum four years of uh, egg laying hen. Um, they could live longer, but that's about as much eggs as you're going to get out of a hen. Um, but, you know, when you get into your her more heritage breeds, they could then produce more eggs for a longer period of time. But then you do need to have that expense if you don't have a rooster, like if you're not able to have a rooster in your location, or if you don't have an incubator, then there's a lot of fees going out to buying um, new hens every year. Yeah, and we talked about that. They've increased mm -hmm. as well. They're in, what, 18 now, roughly for ready to lays. I mean, for us, I think egg liars are the least profitable to sell to bring money into the homestead mm -hmm. just because it's, you know, you'll see there's there's more profitable ways that, that we, we get, garnish it. But I if mean, you have a space issue, like you, you live in town, well, egg layers might be your only option. Yeah. yeah. And there is, um, like, you if you get into, like, a more specialty breed, um, yeah. hen yeah. or, you know, chickens, you can sell, some birds can go anywhere from like, I, I mean, the lower end specialty bird can go for about $35 for a ready to lay, which isn't bad if you can decent, sell those yeah. types of chickens, but then yeah. you get up to like Polish hens, or I don't know if they're called frizzles, you're looking at 80 bucks a hen. So it really depends. Cause you could bring in a lot of money that way. Wow, too. Yeah. That's not something that I do, but I know it is an option and people to do it. Yeah. So. That's something I didn't write down because I, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I knew they were worth money because we have friends that yeah. raise a few rare birds, but mm -hmm. it's just not something we have the numbers to speak to on. On the next for us, it would be uh, next up the scale for us bringing in uh, bringing in profit. It'd be meat birds. Um, meat birds are challenging. So this is like uh, white rocks laying. Uh, we're not talking laying hens. We're talking meat birds that you're going to grow to put in your freezer. So um, again, one of those things is just, we're not taking in cost considerations on your setup. We're assuming that you've already got your fencing. You already have your feeders or waters. And Jay made a good point. You can make do without a lot of that stuff. You can do it really cheaply. And that's why we didn't speak to it. Um, you know, us, we use Electronet. Electronet's gone crazy. It used to be 160 bucks on sale mm -hmm. for a section. Now it's like 300. It's, wow. it's wild, right? 
Um, those are things that we didn't add in on these numbers just because. But on your meat birds, it's nine weeks in return. So nine weeks from chick to time to go to butcher. On For us in Ontario, we're handicapped here in Ontario by the government. We can't butcher our own chickens to sell. They have to be shipped to a um, an abattoir or, or a licensed slaughterhouse to get mm -hmm. slaughtered so that they're inspected and then sold. And Kendra can speak to that uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's got it as part of our processing video that you guys have out on your channel. Yeah. She talks about it. Um, but it's was what seven twenty five for your bird. Yeah, they it was you? between seven and seven fifty uh, a hen or a rooster. Yeah, yeah. And there, I think ours ended up being anywhere from four to seven or eight pounds a bird. Yeah, depending on if you know if it was an older hen, it might be about four pounds. But but that's your cost of butchering. Yeah, that's not including any of the feed. So and then the cost of driving. Like it, yeah, I had to go an hour and. 15 minutes to go to go to an archoir. Yeah. And for us, we don't sell our chickens um, that we raise. We raise it to fill the freezer. So mm -hmm. we factor in 60 chickens a year for us. So it's 52 weeks in a year. That's one chicken a week. One chicken we raise, it averages seven pounds. That seven pounds a, a chicken is good for probably two to three meals for us. Um, and for us, our total investment into them averages over the last two 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 and a half years around nine dollars is what our feed cost is to feed one for nine weeks so a dollar a week on our feed program including the medicated chick starter um and then we have no butchering costs because we do it all ourselves. um and then their freezer bags are included in that fee and whatever else and in the freezer they go i get a full freezer it works out to about 70 cents a pound wow. for pasture raised chicken it's you, you can't beat that i mean uh it it certainly is a high value item for us it's a staple in our um in our meals that we cook we have chicken a few times a week um now more than ever probably because we have, have more of it <laughs> but so you're I, saying 70 pounds a chicken seven pounds. pounds seven pounds per chicken wow and your so your cost into it is 70 cents per pound like that's a pretty and then what did you see at the store today and at store today they were twelve dollars for three chicken breasts small chicken breasts um, boneless skinless with no chicken tender on the inside so i mean yeah. it, it's just there's no comparison wow. right and, and these chicken breasts did not look great <laughs> they didn't look like what we raised right Isn't that so i i think uh, sorry uh, D uh dana had a comment uh for my family, knowing where my food comes from, whether it's bird meat, uh, birds true. for meat, eggs, or, or the pork I raise, makes the difference in cost of buying at the grocery store. That's true. Well, 100%. And that, that's the profit that we're going to see in all of the, the livestock I want to talk about tonight is there's no, there's no, well, your chicken's this much and it's only this much in store because yeah. everybody that's eaten it, including, uh, you know, including people like, like friends of ours that are are you know in the food industry they said well you can't compare these two the taste is so different wow. and that goes for the pork and the beef and the chicken um, i've had people even comment on the on our and eggs. The eggs they're like yeah. the, the you know the your yolk is so yellow it's so dark and then they're yeah. like i've never had fluffier eggs and like people yeah. do comment on that when they buy them they notice the difference it's excellent like we <gasps> we get it from our neighbors when they when our neighbors go away we take care of their chickens so and they say i yeah, just collect whatever yeah. eggs you want so i'll bring a few home and i get all excited because it's a dark egg yolk it's better looking egg it tastes better it cooks better um it's a huge difference and and like dana's saying i mean you, you that's something you can't put a number sign on no. and we talked about it with the price of food if you wanted to buy organic free range um pasture raised eggs or specialty breed yes. eggs i mean you you couldn't aff i couldn't afford to eat it um so for us to raise it and still provide proper nutrition you know for us and our daughter um that's a, a huge bonus, a huge benefit. And there's just no way to put a number on that, really. No. Um, I think that's all I've got for the meat birds. If there's any any other questions on them? No, just another comment uh, from Deep Roots Landscaping. They say, uh, De uh, Denby fried chicken, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wish. I need a fryer. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Dude, we end up doing it. Our chicken, uh, the number one meal that Jenny does with it is she uses the Instapot. I know you, you guys have one too, eh? We, have an Instapot. we got oh, yeah. three of them. I love them. They're awesome. Well, I don't cook really. Jenny does so. <laughs> but Jenny will take a whole frozen chicken, throw it in the Instapot. We don't even think about it. You come back an hour later or whatever it is, it's ready to go. And it tastes great. Um, mm -hmm. And that's great for when we're working around the farm mm -hmm. and we have stuff on the go and we don't yeah. have time to do a big yeah. meal, but it tastes like a big meal. Eh? You know, it's, yeah. it's perfect. Um, I guess. So then we'll, so we've covered them. We'll go into the next one. Sure. <laughs> What's the next one? So the, the next one for us is uh, we're, we're going to go to uh, the pigs. The pigs is um, they're kind of my little hobby, I guess. I, I like the pigs. They're my favorite. Um, today we actually helped the neighbor. He uh, he borrowed uh, one of our boars. Uh, well, our only boar, I guess. He borrowed uh, Big Red. He's our Tamworth boar. Went off to um, Couples Resort, we'll call it, <laughs> for uh, uh, a couple months. Um, and you know that that sow that's going over there came out of our breeding program as well. So um, we we done well with our boar. Um, we know it does well. It sells well at markets, and uh, we use a Berkshire breed, which is a heritage pork. Now, before we talk about you know profit value, we talk about differences. Our pork, for anyone that's on our Facebook page or that's uh, that's on our YouTube and maybe seen um, seen or tasted what it is, it's mm. unbelievably different than what you get in stores. Um, for myself personally, I, I love beef. I like a good steak, but I will take a pork chop like a pork rib chop over any of our steak that's really? that, it's red it's a deep red color the texture is good it melts in your mouth it's Ber berkshire pork is phenomenal but that's just uh, my little <laughs> offside on on that so i raise our pigs um indoors in the winter in the barn and outdoors in the summer on pasture and we use them for uh mainly there are little plows like they plow up and till up around the areas that I need reworked or whatnot is throw the pigs in for a bit and it's it's better than what a tractor can do they're on a tiller too yeah and a tiller, <laughs> yeah well you've seen it eh? like pushing <laughs> old stone fences over like these these guys are incredible um and they're they're smart so you can use minimal infrastructure like a one single strand of electric placed at the right height and they stay in well, um i i like the pigs Pigs are, are quick as well. So for us, you got your egg layers, which is giving you eggs all year long, which is perfect for a homestead, um, especially if you only have one or two. You're not trying to do for profit. You just want to mm -hmm. keep your eggs. Then it's great to add those in. Then you get your meat chickens. You got your nine weeks and boom, your freezer's full after nine weeks, full of chicken. Then your pigs, there's the next on the scale. So pigs for us, it's six to nine months. Um, six, uh, six months, if you're really pack, packing the feed to them or you're, or you're doing hog grower or whatever else, you, you can do a pig from right out, uh, weanling to, um, to butcher weight, which is butcher weight. We send them at about 250 to 270 pounds. Ooh, wow. you, you get back 200 pounds of meat in six months. Hmm. Now I stretched mine out a little longer this year just for timing. So, um, we do them around nine months. Our neighbor, um, who we, we sold the, our, um, some of our sows to. Um, he bought three sows, mm -hmm. chose the best one to keep, and the other two went to, uh, went to butcher last week. They're on the nine months, so a nine month mark. Um, they dressed out around 239 pounds. So 239 pounds of meat you can put in your freezer in nine months. That's wow. a, it's a pretty good wow. option, right? With the pigs, the cost on them, I have this, this pretty well nailed down. We've done pigs for a few years. We've done a lot of pigs. We sold, you know, 44, 4,500 pounds of pork last year. We, uh, we move a lot and we sell all farm direct sales, um, which is market or to customers directly. It doesn't go to sale barn. So our piglet costs, this is where things are going to get a little different. Um, so most people, um, especially homesteads, they want piglets in the spring. They feed them all year, and then they butcher them in the fall. There's a cost to that. Piglets in the spring sell for a premium. Usually 150 is probably what you're going to pay for a piglet in the spring. I think that's a lot of money. That's what the market wow. is demanding these days. So you got 150 in a piglet cost. A cost for us to feed one piglet from right when you get it at 
four weeks old as a weanling to butcher time, it's $250 with our fee tow. And then we add mineral. So our mineral bag we use, it's a, it's a hog mineral or a kelp meal, um, depending on what, what we use. Sometimes we mix a bit of both. We have the kelp meal for the cattle. So it's about $80 a bag for that. So your feed cost total input on your pigs is going to be 480 bucks if you buy it in the spring. That's what's going to cost you to take your pig to butcher. Out of that, in our area, pork is usually selling between six and eight dollars a pound. So we'll go on the low end. Six dollars a pound, you're going to get back a minimum usually of 200 pounds of meat. That's going to give you twelve hundred dollars of value that you threw in your freezer for a total investment of 480 bucks. Hmm. So you're, you're, up, uh, you're up significantly on that. The other thing you add to that too is for a homestead, pigs are an excellent animal. Every part of them is useful front to back. The pig fat or pig lard, the, it goes in for soaps. You can make soap out of it. And Jenny does the skincare products with hers. Um, there's a, on our Facebook, you've probably seen it. It's called Piggy Bomb. Um, she sells it out of our, uh, out of our, our feed hut and it's, uh, it's a, a huge benefit for a lot of people. We have quite a few people that buy it uh, off of us and they've had really good results. Pig, uh, um, pig skin is very similar to ours. Pig lard does a great job. It works wonders for it. Then there's candles. So soy wax and pig lard, you can make candles out of it. So there's benefits in that as well. And you could sell them. Um, but for a homestead, you're probably going to want to keep that stuff for yourself, right? let's say you've got an extra couple hundred dollars in value there. Now you're up $1,400 in each pig for your investment of 480 bucks in the spring. You're going to come walk away with $920 in, a, in profit roughly. Now out of that, let's say you want to sell that pig to a customer. Well, you can't butcher it yourself. Now you've got to go to a butcher. So you're going to have a transport cost. You're going to have a butcher fee, which is usually a dollar, sorry, 85 cents a pound um, per pound hanging weight, which is the 220 to 250, whatever you have. And then a hundred, a dollar 75 per pound for every piece of meat you want smoked. Let's say you want smoked bacon or smoked hams, then there's money on top of that. Hmm. Our average butcher fees, um, we did it in like bulk groups of pigs going. So it's hard to really get a readout per pig, but um Jenny might have a give me the one for three there we go there we go so our total cost to get three pigs butchered and this is on the low end the smaller side was twelve hundred and seventy three dollars and that's with a lot of smoking so we smoked all the bacon which you can take home roughly 25 pounds of bacon per pig which is what we average um, so, and that's, we do it like, that's the nice part about doing this. You can do it thick cut. You can cut it any way you want at a butcher. Yeah. So, um, we do it that way. So that was three pigs. So that's the 1200 bucks divided by three. You're, you're not bad. It's, it could be expensive if you add in sausage though. Sausage is $3 extra a pound. Oh, wow. So you're better off to butcher it for yourself and throw it in your freezer. If you do want to sell it, you have those fees. They'll cut into most of the profit. So then we'll take hundred bucks off of that if you raise them in the winter time and that's a minimum of a hundred bucks because in the winter time all they do is eat and sleep they just lay in the barn eat and sleep and they don't put on uh they don't waste any energy really because they're just hanging out um pigs are pretty docile we find in the winter time the summertime they're into everything jenny's chasing them out of the gardens if they're not fenced right or whatever but um winter time if you buy your pigs around uh, September time frame, you can buy them from most farmers for any size, roughly 50 bucks, 50 bucks. It's almost butcher weight because that farmer wanted to get it into butcher in the fall. He doesn't want to have to deal with the pig all winter. So you can really get a bargain buying your pigs. Then <laughs> using them, um, feeding them through the winter, you get access to butcher dates all winter long because not as many people are picking butcher dates in the winter. So you have a ton of time frame then. So if you are going to do hogs and plan to sell, my recommendation would be to buy in the fall, raise them in the winter, and sell them in the spring. Just how we how we run it. Um, and you're you know usually a hundred, two hundred dollars 
is what you're going to save doing it that way per pig. And it adds up when you add in a few, right? Wow. Yeah. Any questions there, Dan? Uh, so there's uh, a couple of comments. Uh, Dana mentions fresh pork lard is the best for baking too. Yes. Uh, Deep Root Landscaping uh, says the bacon makes it worth it. Yeah. And then Dana also had a question about, uh, did you notice a big difference between winter pork and summer slash fall pork? Not really, no. They're about the same in, in what we do. I mean, yes, there's people that, that swear by bush pigs are the best. And that's what um, the Polish call them bush pigs because they raise, they're raised out in the woods on pasture eating grubs and whatever else. For us, we don't notice as much of a difference because they get hay and straw and mineral, kelp meal and the whole nine yards. Um, and our feed is not just pure hog grower. Our feed is all no animal byproduct. This is a, our feed is... Um, just whole grains. So they're getting a little bit more through that. They don't get the grubs and whatever, but they're not eating uh, eating just pure stuff. Yes, what he's getting, what he's probably leading into, and I, I hear what you're saying. We've seen some people, ex um, especially customers that were leery on that. They've had it where the pig was fed hog grower, kept in a dirty barn, mm. too cramped of a space, and then the pig didn't taste good. It had a, a horrible texture because it was raised like that. Um, you can avoid it by choosing the right feed, keeping on top of your pens, making sure they're bedded properly, access to fresh water. And the number one thing is to make sure your male pigs are castrated because you have something that's called boar taint. It affects, you know, between 10 and 15 percent of pigs they get what's called boar taint, which is like a horrible smell um, that's throughout the meat. Wow. Yeah. Pork. My dad calls it pissy pork, yeah. And uh, my dad was a butcher for you know, 45 years or whatever. And dad would say, you know, you get a few cases come into the store at work of, of pork. He opened the box, smell it, close it. Say, oh, that's no good. Can't sell that because it smelt bad. So if wow. you buy pork from the store and it smells bad, it's uh, just think that the butcher, the butcher uh, didn't smell it. Not everybody can taste pork taint or smell it, but it, it, it is a thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Any uh, further questions before we go? Uh, no, not. Oh, uh, Lauren, uh, Dana has a comment. Pissy pork, exactly. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it, it definitely, like, for me, I, I like the pigs. It's good money. Nobody, um, like, I bet you at the farmer's market, if we really tried hard, we could probably start a fist fight over the bacon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that good. I almost cried when I realized we didn't save enough, eh, Jenny? It was, uh, I was like, I opened the fridge door one day. I'm like, hey, there's no bacon. She, and she whispered from top, we sold it all. And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean we sold all the bacon? Like, we, we screwed up. <laughs> yeah. This year, yeah, this year we planned it properly. But anyway, we won't, we won't run into that problem. Um, pork is good. It's a great way to get your name out there in the uh, farm, like, like to get your farm name or your homestead name out. You can raise really good pork um, by choosing the right breeds. They don't take a lot of space. They're an intelligent animal. Um, they're not like sheep. Uh, they're fairly hardy. I, I, I highly recommend pork adding it to the homestead. And like, like we brought up, all those things are really, uh, really, really good to, uh, to add as products. Um, the one other thing that pigs can do with the leaf litter so leaf litter is pork fat but it's a certain part of the pork fat that gets mixed in with um if you're going to do venison sausage bear sausage wild game if you want to cut that to make it taste a little better or add a little bit of fat flavor to it let's say you've got um you want to make homemade burgers out of your um grass-fed finished beef you want to add a bit of your pork fat to it the leaf litter is awesome and you get a lot of it off of each pig so that, that's really all I got for that. Do you want to know what it is? A little bit, yeah. It's, it's on the inside of, inside of the leg. leg. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's where the fat... Where it, uh, it kind of is. It's bumpy. It looks yeah. funny, but it's that's... the easiest one to render because the skin, like the fat that's on the skin, you have to like carve it off of the skin and it's, it's yeah. difficult to get off. But that, cube it up, good to go. Yeah. It works great. And you, you got your thing there? Yeah. She's got her piggy bomb. Her. That's a piggy bomb, but it, it's just like a soy wax and lard. And that's your uh, skincare product. And we use it this time of year, especially where everything's super dry, right? Mm. Um, but you can, anybody can make that. Jenny does a few batches out of our, our pig fat. Um, and, and 
does it up and we use it in the winter time especially like when you're looking at moisturizer and stuff you don't know what's in it well mm. i know what's in that it's two things right wow which or three things so that's that's really the next the next biggest profit you can add to a homestead is adding a pig all of the animals do a great job pigs are really useful they do bring a profit and if you don't want to raise a pig to eat it let's say you run out of um, you, you know, you, you grow a heart <laughs> or you don't want to eat them or whatever else. And you want to just run a pig breeding program and you want the benefits of the pig. So you, you know, pig manure is excellent to add in with stuff, um, for your compost. You want to use them for land clearing, especially if you've got a couple acres of heavily forested stuff, run pigs through it. They'll clear that thing out for you. To move your compost, pigs will do it too. Those pigs will do it. Yeah. So let's say you want to do it that way. The numbers on pigs piglets so each sow is going to have roughly six to you know let's say 10 heritage pigs have less sows than um, commercial breeds but heritage pigs are in demand so you get a little bit more for each piglet our sows averaged seven piglets um, this last last breeding season we sold ours on the lower end just because i you know i, I didn't want to get stuck a whole bunch over the winter time mm -hmm. because i knew i had surgery and whatever else and, I, and jenny was gonna have to take care of them so we went uh, $80. We sold uh, each piglet for 80 bucks. Most of the time, though, you're going to breed them in the spring. You're going to get 150 bucks minimum per piglet. Out of that, let's say you got seven times 150, you're going to be over a thousand bucks in it. Then you've got, you're going to feed your sow. She's going to take two totes of feed a year, so roughly $500 in feed, 160 in mineral, and $50 in straw for bedding. And that's a $420 profit raising pigs, uh, raising a litter of pigs, and that sow stays with you, and you can have her again. And for those, before we get a question on, well, what about breeding? Just like now, I lent my boar to the neighbor, and the deal is he keeps it for two heat cycles. He feeds the boar for two months. I don't charge him anything. It's just a farm trade. That's a, and most cases, you're going to find that too. So it's, it's really a there's no cost in a boar let's say you know two months of feed is seven dollars a pound it's not that much mm. um and it's you know 420 bucks for a litter of piglets out of all after all your expenses and keeping the sow for a year plus you get the benefits she provides that's an easy way to do it too and a lot of people just raise, raise piglets they don't raise from weanling to finish because of that yeah any questions before we move off the uh, just one comment about on how to uh have a profit from the homestead. David Knight says, "Hi, if you want to make a million bucks homesteading, start with two million. <laughs> yeah, usually, yeah, a hundred percent. Dave's Dave's bang on. Like more, more. I think you can do it probably on a small scale homesteading to make a little bit of money to save on your groceries. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get into farming, you're there's no money in farming unless you're like giant, really. I mean, it's not. It's you're a hobby out with more than just." one specific uh, yeah because yeah. how do you say to somebody well i'm going to charge you now for my three hours a day of labor times nine months you know it's yeah. just yeah you're doing it as a hobby and and that's why most farms in canada are ran by people 65 plus who's doing it as a hobby mm -hmm. i mean that that's just the way it is there is a bit of money in cattle and that probably is a good time to lead into our next question or our next topic which mm -hmm. is cows and before I go into that, I want to talk about cattle requires more facilities. Um, they require a little bit more equipment. Now you can do it um, with less, but let's assume you already have a homestead. You've already got the land. You already have a truck or a trailer or a tractor or an ATV to move the fencing or, or something like this. We're going to say that you have at least something to manage most of the cattle's needs, waterers, feeders, etc. So going with that, you're a small homestead, you now have all those things and you say, okay, I want some cows. There's many, many different breeds of cows and numbers are gonna change for every different breed you go with, right? We have experience with Dexters. Um, we started with them because they're the smallest breed of cow. Um, they're supposed to be the most uh, or the easiest cow to uh, uh, to sort of raise as a homesteader. They're also a dual purpose breed. So that means they're good for meat and dairy. 
And at some point they were used as oxen, but those days are long gone. So, <laughs> so um, our page has a, a lot of videos that you would see in the beginning of, you know, the small Dexter bulls and the Dexters are small, they're manageable size. They are incredibly intelligent, um, which is good and bad. Um, but we, we like the Dexter breed and we would say if you're a homesteader looking at small scale raising Dexters or raising cattle on your own, that's the breed I would push. Um, we've raised Highland and Highland can be challenging, especially with fencing. Um, Highland cows, they'll jump a four foot fence if they feel like it. The electric fence means nothing to them. They're basically in on goodwill. <laughs> I mean, Thorhaven can probably is probably going to say, "I ah, know you're full of crap," but this is our experience. Um, we had one there; his name was Rocky, and he was in just because everybody else was. They didn't care about the fencing; it was just an obstacle that if he needed to get through it, it was fine. Yeah. yeah. Environment makes a big difference. Yeah. So if they're in a pen and they're eating hay all day long, they're happy. That's okay, but we are pushing them to graze. Yeah. And to mob grace. So it's a whole different story. So it mm. depends on where you're at. Yeah. True. So Dexter's also, which leads into Jenny's talking about mob grazing, we do regenerative grazing on this ranch because it's been, you know, it's coming up close to 200 years. This place has been an active farm mm -hmm. in one way, shape, or form. But the last probably 50 years, there hasn't been a lot of input in it at all. So, and it was almost vacant for the last few years. So we use the cattle to graze down some of those poor quality forages, some of that heavy brush, raspberry patches that were just widely overgrown all over the place. Dexters are like the goats of the cattle world. Wow. Those buggers <laughs> eat just about anything and they're feed efficient, which brings me to the next kind of getting in the numbers. Let's say you want to be a homestead. You want to homestead your cattle. You're living off grid. You don't want nothing to do with nobody living the dream. We'll call it. <laughs> um, and you say, all right, I don't want to deal with um, somebody else for a bull. I want my own bull. I want my own cow. I want to I want to get a calf every year. Okay, you can do that. I've worked the numbers out. That's three head of cattle. Dexter cattle, that's the key. Dexter cows, you're going to be roughly 20 pounds of hay per day is what they're going to take. I work these numbers out considering that you're going to have them in a pen and be feeding hay 365 days a year without using any grazing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to have some grazing, this and that. That's why the cattle, I'm, I've priced it out as considering it being a yearly basis instead of 18 months. Long story short, the heifers are 18 pounds of hay per day is what a, a Dexter heifer requires for that. The steers and the bulls are 25 pounds of hay per day. And trust me, they sit at a feeder and eat. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Um, now, when you get a cow, cow means she's had a calf or um, has had calves in the past. That's considered a cow. A heifer is a cow that's female that has not had a calf yet. Okay. A steer is a male cow that's been castrated. So he's no longer got his parts and a bull is a male bull that's used for breeding. So those are the terminology. You want to go with a cow. Um, when you're buying a Dexter, you're going to want good breed genetics. A good quality Dexter cow will run you, you know, let's say um, 1000 to $2,000. Kind of tops. I wouldn't pay any more than that for one. Certain times of the year, you almost get them given to you, um, especially in the winter. The bulls, you can find good quality Dexter bulls all over the place. There's a lot of them here in Ontario now. Southern Ontario is full of them. Eastern, Eastern Ontario, our area, Jenny, there's a lot that are out this way now. Oh, in Manitoba. They're all over the place. They're everywhere. There's a whole Facebook page on them. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you're going to want a good bull and a good cow. You start with those two things. After, eight, uh, after nine months, you're going to have your first calf. So... Now you've got a cow, a bull, and a and a and a okay. steer or a, or a heifer calf. It doesn't matter. Hmm. You're going to raise that for 18 months before you can put it in the freezer. The cost to raise your bull, your cow, and your calf um, in in hay is 20,000 pounds of hay per year. Oh, wow. It sounds kind of scary, right? <laughs> so that's 
six dollars um, per square bell is what we are here. If you go to a farmer that does large squares down in Renfrew, you can usually find them for about six bucks. If you convince them to sell you sell to the small guy, then you can do six bucks. If you go to a feed store, forget it. It's like fifteen dollars a square bale. Yeah. It's just that's how much they are. So let's say you're six bucks a bale. Most of the times you can find them for that, especially if you locate your hay guy in the summer at the right four time. Four. Yeah, four to six. So it's four hundred and six squares for those three cows is what it's going to take to feed them three hundred sixty five days a year. That cost is going to be two thousand four hundred thirty six bucks. That's your hay cost. That doesn't include your mineral cost. Mineral, you can do the salt blocks. They're not that expensive or your feeders or whatever, like we talked about. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of high. Mm. If you have the equipment, like we talked about before, where, you know, now I get talk, you're going to want a tractor that can lift a bale of hay. This is where that comes into play. You get a tractor that can lift a round bale of hay and you buy round bales. You're only going to need 34 round bales. And you can buy them for forty dollars a bale, so that's thirteen hundred and sixty bucks. That's a huge difference. Yeah, that's a savings. <laughs> yeah, you know that a couple of years and you paid for your old tractor. So you got thirty-four rounds. At eighteen months, you're gonna you're gonna take that first calf to butcher. That calf is gonna butcher a carcass weight or a hanging weight. They call it. That's pretty well what you're gonna put in your freezer between two eighty and three hundred fifty pounds of meat. I did the numbers, ranging it out at 300 pounds of meat. Grass-fed and finished heritage beef sells for $10 a pound. That's what it costs if you were to buy it. You can buy junk from Argentina and Mexico at Walmart cheaper, sure, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about good quality, high-protein beef, and it's cut the way you want it. So if you want an inch-and-a-half cut steak, that's the way you can tell your butcher to cut it, right? Um, you're going to get porterhouse, ribeyes, T-bones, all the stuff that I can't afford if I was to buy it in a store. You get it off of your cows. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge bonus, especially for us as braised beef ribs. When Jenny, short ribs, short ribs sorry. Yeah. <laughs> ribs. Jenny makes those ribs, like cancel my day. I'm showing up for them. Don't bug me <laughs> at that point because <laughs> they're amazing. Anyway, so you're going to run into that at 300 pounds, 10 bucks a pound. That's $3,000 is what that calf is worth if you were to sell it or if you put it in your freezer. Your total investment in that, it's only gonna be 1360. Wow. So you're up, you're up money if you're in rounds, right? Obviously it's 2436 is uh, if you go small squares. Mm -hmm. So again, buy a tractor. Anyway, just saying. You can manage with that. You need a tractor. You need a truck. <laughs> you absolutely need a truck. A truck or a trailer, an SUV with a trailer yes, to you... pick up your round bale. The farmer, yeah, the farmer will load the hay bale on for you, um, but you're going to need to find a way to get it off. That's all. And those round bales are, uh, I didn't do $400 junk round bales on the budget. Like I'm budgeting a 500, 600 pound round bale, well-packed, good quality forage. All hay is different. You want to buy good hay. It's worth the extra investment. You can buy $20 round bales. Those are not going to feed your cattle appropriately. You mm. want to buy good quality stuff. Um, so now you've got a $3,000 worth of beef. But on top of that, you've just milked that cow because the Dexter's put enough milk out to provide for the calf and for you to take for your family. So you've got milk, you've got cheese, you've got butter, you've got cream, you got all the things associated out of that. On top of that, those guys are going to clear your lawn. I haven't started a lawnmower here since we bought the place. I cut hay and that's it. But there's obviously a good comment. Jay's laughing. Yeah, so Kendra needs a cow. That's what Dave says. I've been telling her this, Dave, for, for a long time. And, and Dana, you're going to start a fight here, I think. But everyone needs a tractor. Yeah. <laughs> See? So when you. Yeah. We should. Yeah. We'll just talk old tractors. Yeah. Right. I <laughs> no, think Dave would Nobody would watch, too. but we'd enjoy it. <laughs> They would be there. Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. They would be yeah. there, yeah. <laughs> but so we, you've got, out of that, you've got all your dairy products, which right now in the store, looking at it, I literally went, are you serious? About three times in no frills today. And some old lady looked at me like, is he talking to himself? <laughs> like, you know, but literally, I couldn't believe it. Like, it's just out to lunch. And I was literally watching somebody 
looking through the milk sections and he went all the way to that horrible stuff they call almond milk and whatever crap that <laughs> is not milk because that's what he could afford he couldn't he couldn't buy the stuff why like he wanted the two percent yeah. from brooms there anyway so i mean that's huge i'm yeah. almost regretting us selling that milk cow that we had an excellent milk cow that would stand in the field and milk but oh well well I, yeah the, the non-dairy person had to milk it ah, that's it yeah <laughs> The one that wants those almond milk, whatever else. Thank you. <laughs> she liked Jenny the most. <laughs> she did. She loved Jenny, that cow. But she's just down the road, so at least we know where she there is. Um, and the, uh, the the other thing that you can add on top of the value-added product is hides. Cow hides sell for good money. And Dexter's being a horn breed, you want to buy a horn Dexter cow. Honestly, the horns haven't caused us problems. This is a huge fight all over the internet about mm -hmm. horns, not horn, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, Jenny, we've never had anything gutted or whatever. We haven't been poked by them or whatnot. They're very conscientious of where their horns are. They don't wreck them in the feeders or whatever. They're 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 good that way. It's but a, for the animal. that's right. It's that's a whole topic. It's mm -hmm. from the research we've done. Horns are healthier for the animal. Animal they serve a purpose. Oh yeah. Um, now a horned cow, when you butcher it, the skull with horns is going to bring value. So you can blanch the skull, you bleach it white or whatever, you boil it off, you put the horns on and you have a mount. That mount, we've been offered 450 bucks for the one we just did um, off of our last horn cow. Wow. So that's another value that's added to there that you can sell. And I mean, how many horn heads do you want hanging in your house, right? I'm not into it myself. So um, it's a good product to sell. That's 450 bucks. That just paid for most of your chickens, right? So yeah. um, you want you want to look at that as, as your options. Then you've got manure on top of it. Cow manure, you have a pig, you got pig manure, and you have chicken manure. You got the trifecta of things that you want to add a compost pile and manure pile to really kickstart your gardens. Now, I don't have sheep, but they would be the next option to have to. Mm. Um, now you've got lawn care. I don't have a lawn tractor anymore we fence off the area the cows come in they graze it all down i don't have to start it i don't have to maintain it i don't have to waste time doing it that's priceless to me i hate doing it mm -hmm. we use the horses in spots where we don't want the cows so um, that's a, a good option a good thing that adds value and profit to the homestead as well when we talk sheer numbers on it you've got thirty seven hundred dollars in profit or profitable items or value that you've got out of that cow um, and you're going to take off your cost of hay. I'm going to assume that most people are going to go rounds or they'll find a way to make it work just because you're going to save almost $1,000 going yeah. that route versus the squares. So you've got $1,264 off of that $3,000 and the remainder is yours. You make good money on that, right? You're making, you know, almost, almost $2,400 or whatever per cow a calf that you put in your freezer now if you want to butcher it and sell it let's say you have a trailer and you're able to transport yourself to butcher and you have a client that wants to buy half of that cow or the whole of that cow and that's going to pay you ten dollars a pound for it or you sell it piece by piece at farmers markets you can sell that as pure profit the only thing coming off on your butcher fees is about 250 bucks right it's 85 cents a pound to get it done so there's a, um, about 100, but it varies depending. So it usually, if you ask for the horn and stuff back, you have to go to somewhere where they charge a higher kill fee because not everybody wants it. But anyway, so that's one way to do it. That's doing your beef with a bull. This is self-sufficient, never going to need to anybody else, No, not going to worry about it. Dexter Cow will provide you with a calf for up to 18 years. Wow. Some of them live up to 20, providing a calf. A bull is good for probably 10 years. They get pretty crusty after that. We mm. have, uh, so, you, you know, you've got a long span to be able to keep this these uh, livestock going. If you want to go just a cow and a calf, and you're going to borrow somebody's bull, and which is, there's lots of them out there. Somebody is already looking to get that bull off their farm um, during certain times of the year where they don't want their, their beef bread or whatever. So you can borrow a bull or you can ship your cow out somewhere to get bread or you can use artificial insemination and you only want to do a cow and a calf and that's your milk cow now. 
your cost coming in significantly less. So your initial investments in hay, it's only 13,000 pounds of hay. It's almost half as much um, without running a bull, right? That's 278 squares. So 1,664 bucks total cost in hay. If you're running rounds, that's only 24 rounds. That's 960 bucks. Your calf is going to bring you the same value. So you're taking home 3,000 or sorry, 2,700. Forty dollars a few rounds in value, so you're better to go that route, mm -hmm. and that's why you need a cow. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. why I need a cow. Yeah. Dave uh, Knight says I want to be a bull in my next life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they don't do much. They just well, they eat, they eat, moan, they they eat moan, and chase women. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. The cow. Now do sorry do does the cost change now that you've moved to the belt? Oh, yeah. yeah big time like our fernando weighed i don't know what 1200 pounds he was heavy like our little dexter bull like his brisket just about drags on the ground and i ran into his new owners today at the store and uh, we were chatting and he hasn't left the feeder she said uh he looks like he's gonna give birth to a square bale kind of thing <laughs> like it, that's kind of how he is right like this time of year he's not working so he really puts the muscle and fat on Wow. Um, but he weighed 1200 pounds. Our new bull is, he, he's almost over 2000 pounds. That's a significantly more hay going to belted wow. Galloways, right? The difference is though, is our belted Galloways, um, they don't have horns. Um, so you, you don't have that cost in, in skull, but we're looking at going larger quantities of cattle. So I'd like to be able to go, yeah, I got 10 calves ready. I only need two to go in the freezer and uh you know eight or let's say seven and one is coming for us um are going to go to to auction and sell well at auction with no horns and that breed they'll sell well so that's why we went that route yeah hmm. i think that's it eh, jenny there's no other reasons really they look pretty that's what jenny says they look pretty yeah <laughs> They are the belteds are, are really pretty. They're not pretty. as smart as the Dexters. The Dexters can be like sometimes almost too smart. Yeah, mm -hmm. like annoyingly and smart. Challenge you a little yeah. bit. Wow. Like George knows how to get up in the second story of the barn, but he doesn't know how to get down. Like he's stupid. But anyway, today he was playing with the electrical board. Yeah, that's that's a Dexter. They're a little bit more intelligent. The Galloways are they're not as like super friendly. They're quieter. They're quieter. Yeah. They're more leery of people, but uh, I would say they're not as intelligent. Like they get shocked by the fence once. Well, all right, I'm good. Where a Dexter's like, well, I might just test you today to see if I could jump through that fence today. And now I'm sitting at the campfire and there's a friggin'. I go, Jenny, look, there's a calf looking at me. This, this was a couple of years ago. And she's like, what? And they had like three strands of electric and he just decided I'll just crawl through that. That's fine. <laughs> like that's Dexter's. They're a little smarter than. Than a Galloway. Galloway's a little easier to work with for us. If there wasn't hay in the pen right now, he'd probably be out as well. George, yeah. No, no, no. Oh, the little man. No, yeah, no. yeah, he would. And that's the other thing with Daxter too. They're so small. Um, commercial style feeders and stuff don't really work for them. You've okay. got to kind of build your own or buy sheep stuff because they're that that's mm -hmm. that much smaller. But very good options. I, I like the cattle. I think there, if you want to add profit to the homestead, you've got one cow for yourself. You add in a calf, that calf you take to sell, um, and there's where your money's going to come from, right? You can do market gardens and stuff like we've been hitting around at the idea of it, but um, you know, really, the the cattle are an excellent uh, a, an excellent profit adder to a homestead. I mean, we brought them initially in because Jenny has horses, so I thought, well, we need something to help help offset the cost of those hay burn and things i mean pets but uh yeah so that's kind of what we did and the the cattle's helped in a way you stink mo <laughs> mo was uh our little pup fell asleep below us and he's uh giving us the other side of having livestock mo <laughs> mo likes to eat pig manure so um if you have dogs that's one thing with pigs there's a lot of grain stuff in their manure and their feed is all grain, right? It's very similar to dog food. So mm -hmm. they're in it whenever you, whenever they get a chance. Oh, no. Yeah. Any questions out? So I come out of that, Jay? Uh, not that I see yet. Um, 
not sure. Did you have any thoughts on? No. So I guess we're kind of looking at profit on the homestead as what we're kind of bringing into the house, not so much as income. Yes. So that's yeah. like a whole nother topic, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when you can raise $3,000 worth of beef that I couldn't go out and buy $3,000 yeah. worth of beef every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can, I can raise it for a thousand bucks and eat like a king. Well, I'll do it. That makes sense to me. That's the profit that I see in raising cattle. Pigs are the same. And we talked about with gardens too, right? Like yeah. being on a homestead, we talked before the video started kind of how fortunate being homesteaders and mm -hmm. having some property and living rural is, um, especially in today's markets. Like, yeah. you know, we're, we're able to say, well, tomatoes are too much. We'll throw some tomato plants in and grow them. I feel really bad for people that are in apartments that are just stuck bearing the brunt of these costs at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we were talking about kind of weighing the pros and cons of like, even if I, I have a couple different jobs that I do, but, um, you know, I recently had to give up, uh, you know, just a casual job that I picked up because, uh, spring is coming up and I got a garden and I'm thinking, you know, the little bit of money that I'm making on the side from this and it's taking away a lot of the garden time. Yeah strangely enough like we would make more profit growing all those crops in the summer than i would having that little casual job on the side yeah. and that sounds really weird because most people are like well why wouldn't you just go buy your food with the the money that you're making and i'm like that's the thing when you garden when you have well how much you said today how much cucumbers were yeah it was 6.99 for those little buggers like that yeah. like i couldn't believe so it 6.99 for what maybe six little tiny yeah, cucumbers. Was five or six in there and I, I usually plant a, about two to three cucumber plants yeah. and I have so many, Yeah, you know, like, and this is thing, if you're not wasting it, it's, it's just all profit, right? Yeah. So whether you're doing pickles or relish or anything like that with those, to me, like it just, the profit outweighs everything else. So just ha being able to have that time, because a lot of, a lot of the times, like even us, we sit here and we think about, you know, how do you, and I know Dana's brought it up too. Like, how do you make income on your homestead? Because there's a lot of time and effort. And yeah. then there's sacrifice of that time, whether you could be spending it somewhere else, making some income. But then again, you're never going to be able to compare the food that you're yeah. growing, raising, compared to what you're going to go buy in the store. Yeah. Right? Like, I know, well, how many times that. have you seen? And I've done it. Where, like, I'll go to the reduced section. Yeah. And yeah, I'll get, you know, a couple bags of $2 tomatoes or something in the reduced section, at, you know, during the winter. But how many times do you see a lot of like older, elderly people in the reduced section buying like yeah. bruised, moldy, reduced food? You know, like you can't compare the food that you can grow at your own home yeah. to the because the prices are astronomical and then you don't even know if you're getting good quality vegetables or um yeah. meat i remember growing up as a kid you know there was me and my brother as a you know teenagers will say mom would have two shopping carts and it would be like you know 80 to 100 bucks and we'd leave the store on yeah. that and we'd have everything Mm -hmm. I mean, now for the three of us, and you guys are a family three as well, mm -hmm. you can't leave the grocery store with next to nothing for a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. And today it will really hit home. I seen it a few months ago when we were down in, uh, in, in Northbrook and there was a guy that was, you could tell he was making some serious decisions Aww. and his cart was almost empty. And this was an elderly gentleman, fairly well dressed. And he wasn't the only one in the store then. And now costs have gone so much higher. And I seen it in No Frills today and we figured out why it was so busy. It was, you know, the, the old age pension come out, I guess. So I seen it in No Frills and Walmart. And I mean, these guys are really, really yeah. making tough choices. Jason and, it, and I were in uh, Pembroke this past week yeah. at, at the No Frills. And like we, wa well, I watched this man go around with his cart and you know he might have had like um like tin foil loaf of bread cheese some milk 
like just a really small amount in his cart. And he would go and he's, you know, he's looking at the shelf. So he's looking at the milk and you can see him. He's just looking at the pricing or whatever he's looking at. And he looks at his cart and then he grabs the, the carton or the, yeah, the carton of milk and he puts it down and then he grabs a tin foil and then he walks over to the shelf and he puts it back. And then I watched him go over, you know, to the bread section and he's looking and he takes his time. And I was watching because um, Jason and Hannah were doing something. So I had a little minute. I'm just just watching this man. And then he picks something else off the, the, the cart or off the shelf, put it in the cart. And he's staring at his cart. And he took something else out of his cart and he put it back. And I'm thinking like, that makes me really sad that, that has gotten to that point where you yeah. can't buy like tin foil. You know, like he, yeah. he put it back for the, the sake of grabbing milk. And I'm thinking like, wow. And then it makes me feel really fortunate that we have the ability to be able to grow our own food here. Yeah. So even though we like when you look at moving, you know, onto the farm full time or doing it full time, well, let's say you just made all your chicken, you made all your pork and all your beef because you spent time at home raising it yeah. and you cut all that out of your grocery bill. Well, that saves you a couple thousand dollars a year. Okay. Then you save your dairy. Then you grow your own vegetables. Like a large expense now in households is fastly becoming groceries. It's mm -hmm. groceries, and, 100%. You know, uh, now you get to the next part of the homestead. You heat with wood heat. We hit, heat with wood heat. There's no propane or oil that we have it as backup. But so I'm at home cutting firewood. Well, every stick of firewood is one less dollar in heater oil. It's true. So even though you might not be getting the dollars on the front end of a a seventy thousand dollar a year job well you don't have travel expenses to go to that job every day you don't have insurance and vehicle maintenance you don't have time away for your your family you don't have the ability to um to grow your own food because you don't have time to put a garden in and you can't take a, a week off to to go cut your firewood for the year or whatever else without sacrificing so you might not make it in value that way but in what you're putting in is is different. Yeah. And if you get seventy thousand dollars a year, but groceries cost you twenty thousand dollars a year, and you're trying to save money on it, and you're not doing it through healthy choices, you're going to end up eating peanut butter sandwiches and oh, grilled cheese and pasta and junk because that's the way it is. Yeah. So really, I think it's as a of profit, you're profiting from a better lifestyle. You are pro. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's for, we're fortunate to be in that situation, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's other things that, yeah, it's times are, are tough sometimes because you don't have the ability, like, you know, for me and my my uh, previous profession, like, I, I go away on a trip for a few months and make some extra money and come home and go, yeah, like, let's do this and that and whatever. And it was there, but times are different now. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, groceries didn't cost what they cost back then. Yeah. Ah. Nor did the diesel, nor did fuel, nor did whatever. Uh, things are things are drastically more expensive. They are. Yeah. And this is where I think that it is so important. Like if you are thinking, I know that the people on here today, they kind of already kind of living in this lifestyle. But if you are watching it later on and you are thinking about doing this lifestyle, you yeah. may you are probably going to have to make sacrifices. But it is there is no greater feeling than the fact that you can put some food on the table without oh. having to rely on the store. Like yeah. the, there, there's not a better feeling out there than doing that. There's nothing better than opening that freezer and go on, oh, okay, I'm good. Well, how many like, freezers do you have right now full of your meat or whatever? What do we have, Jenny? Four? Three. Four, but I would say three of them were actually full of meat. Three is meat. The rest is veggies and stuff that she's put now, away. Now, would the and... average person be able to afford three freezers full of meat today no nope. to fill their family no nope. not at all I don't know. what does that cost us right now that's <laughs> so the cost is there's two beef and no, there's only one now. well what we've eaten probably a whole I'll yeah call it one hole. so one hole that's mm -hmm. three thousand and then you've got a whole freezer full of chicken which is, which is uh 70, of them now. 70 chickens oh. left and a chicken pasture raised chicken whole chicken is worth um, 20 to 35 20 to 35 yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't afford to stock that you couldn't um, afford to eat the way that you're eating today no without this lifestyle no and and so that's where the profit is yeah right yeah 
Yes. And I'm not eating hamburger every night. Like Jenny's cooking porterhouse. We had braised beef ribs, short ribs, porterhouse steaks, T-bone steaks. Uh, I mean, we're eating good. Where's the invite? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, not. I just made jerky, so. I don't stay this big for no reason, right? Like, <laughs> and, uh, we, we eat good. And, that, and that's, a, that's really the benefit. Mm-hmm. I mean, and my daughter eats a healthy meal and goes to school every day with a full belly and proper nutrition. And, and you know what's being put into your products, yeah. which is key. Like, yeah. 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 So Danny was just mentioning that uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Working 50 hours a week, then tending gardens and animals takes a lot out of the day. It does. It can become overwhelming. Um, I want to be able to live from the homestead alone. And his other comment, we're running four chest freezers also. I couldn't afford to fill them from the store for certain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Dave Knight, uh, yeah, Dave Knight uh, has a comment. Uh, I was out back hunting foods and up from the ground came up bubbling curd. <laughs> Brew. Right? He's talking to Beverly Hillbillies. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Yeah, we're hillbillies. We'll call it. We'll call it like it is. Yeah. <laughs> But the, the thing that the thing that goes like we started uh, before we did homesteading, we did hunting. So I just renewed all my hunting licenses uh, this week. Wow! Holy jeez! Yeah, like, I was almost five hundred dollars before I got my my hunting license, fishing license, renewal, small games, firearms renewal. I, I was like, holy! Like, wow! I, I don't I don't even I haven't even put gas in the truck or bullets in the gun to go hunt yet. Like I can raise a cow for cheaper than and I just got all my license for, get it and it's a gamble. Yeah, <laughs> it's a gamble. That, and well, at I, least with fishing, it's not as expensive. But for the rest of it, I don't know. Like it depends if you fish from shore. True. If you need to get a boat yeah. now, they're not. Well, you're good. Yeah. yeah, you just need to make sure you can row. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I don't have the motor yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah. No, but I I hear what Dana is saying because. It, it is really hard to figure out. And so we're not here telling you that it's easy. No, you know, we God, don't no. live a life of like ease yeah. by any means. And I know that you know that. But, um, you know, we do without a lot of things. But we are also, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we, you know, have all the income that we need to have solely on our homestead and that's one thing i've been looking at and researching is like you know what other outsources are there to provide income because you know we still work and you know there's still other things that need to be done even with us you know in the homestead life that we are doing uh we i don't really have the answer on how to do that but um these little steps of just having not having to go out and buy your meat not having to go and get my eggs not having to buy new chickens every year those are just little steps of getting to hopefully where also you want to be is you know how to be solely self-reliant in the way of income and um being able to provide so i don't know how else to do that other than you know maybe having like some kind of I know that I was looking at a few things we talked about earlier um you know there's things you can do to bring in home um money in on the homestead by having businesses on the side or maybe having yeah. um having some online kind of job or something like that but um that's a whole nother topic but I know that you know Dana's brought it up a few times and it is something that it stops a lot of people from making the move because they're they don't want to give up that income no, uh, so, we we started the plan long before it came to this, and like, you know, I have income from previous employment. Mm-hmm. Jenny has a business that she runs, a cottage rental business that she did before. We started cutting debt and expenses and paying down to make sure that we weren't in a, a like, a, you know, a lot of people probably that that I worked with before my previous career thought like you're never going to be able to do it. Um, but we didn't have vehicle loans. We didn't have massive debt. We didn't have you know, uh, things that were tying us into it, like, uh, you know, I, I drive 30 year old trucks, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to make, make exceptions in that. And then there's other ways to profit too. You need to find your skill set to add a little bit. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to come up short or whatever, I can always go back to, to wrench something. 
like mm -hmm. to fix something because that's what my skill set was before. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as uh, probably the same as you guys, like in your profession, if you ever get to the point where, you know what, we need to buy something extra, or we need to make mm -hmm. a little bit more, you have to find a way to do it. Yeah. And, and that is what it is. I mean, right now our equipment is getting older that we use every day. Like our, for example, our side by side is what, 10 years old, babe. Yeah, it's 10 years old. It's 2013. So it's 10 years old. It's got an issue with it right now that the fix for it's 1800 bucks. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to wow. put $1,800 into a 10 year old machine. So you look at a new one and it's like, whew, I don't know how I could pay for a new one off of the homestead. It doesn't pay for a new one. Yeah. So if I want that, I'm going to have to find um, something to supplement it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I just note on something? Who was it that said? Oh yeah, okay, so Dana. Um, just in regards to the amount of time that you put into stuff, like into your farming and that, um, versus like passive income. Mm -hmm. So, I, I guess like what I want to say is that like we do our stuff regeneratively, so it takes us a lot of time, lot of time and yeah. we don't make that back. No. Nope. Right. Yeah. However you can kind of make it more passive. So like if we were to put our cattle into, if we, if we already had different pastures fenced and you're just basically shoving them out there, they're passive all summer. If, especially if you have a stream running, right? You, you don't have to do anything with yeah. them, really. We, we choose to do it differently. Same as our meat chickens. We choose to run them on pasture and move fencing every day we could easily just put them in a little you know, in the barn, in the barn throw them in the barn whatever. and throw them feed once a day and that's it and yeah. water mm -hmm. so i just want to make sure that people know that who are looking into this going well i'd like to do that but like that sounds like a lot of work you don't have to make it a lot of work yeah that's right you're yeah. still going to have those instances where something happens where maybe someone gets out and it ruins your day and you <laughs> got to do stuff like that and then you want to sell everything once yeah. a week, once a week in the summer, I want to sell everything. <laughs> <laughs> so those yeah. flukes happen, yeah. but in general, like there are ways of doing it more passively. Yeah. It's just a matter of, and that, That's true. that yeah. time equates to money. And it equates does. to different things yeah. too, right? So it really depends on how you want to do it. Mm -hmm. so. Like pigs, pigs are pretty passive when they're in the barn. When they're out on pasture, it's more important to stay on top of them. You can't leave pigs in one certain area because they'll turn it into the surface in the moon. So they have to be moved. Mm -hmm. um, and je like Jenny said, we choose to do it that way because we think that's the best way forward for the soil and the land. Mm -hmm. And I think she actually enjoys fencing. I hate it. But um, the electric. It's my quiet time. Yeah. yeah. She, <laughs> she just does her thing. And that's, that's a hobby at the same time. Yes. And, and and I mean, if you're not enjoying it, then you probably don't want to get into it. If you're trying to do it to make money, yeah. like Dave said, start with two million and you'll end up with one. But um, if you're doing it because you enjoy what you're doing, yeah. you're learning every day. Every day is new. And as m the best laid plans as us in the summertime, like um, they go to waste. But in a way, it's kind of exciting because you never know what you're going to do. We come home from the store a lot um, in town or whatever, supply run or whatnot. And on the way up the road, I go, I wonder if anyone's out or what do we going to have when we get home today? And we get in and sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes everybody's exactly where you left them and you say, yay. Or, you know, other times it's a disaster, but it's still exciting and fun. It like, has to you be know? fun. Though. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like for me, gardening is like with Jenny, she said that fencing is her quiet time gardening is my peaceful time i'm out there i'm just sitting there in nature listening to the birds um when it's not fly season but I was about to say, yeah, exactly. <laughs> not during the not during the black fly season but i enjoy just being out there and then again with the chickens like i know that you know it doesn't make a lot of profit but I enjoy them. I enjoy watching them. I enjoy Mentally, spending time yes, with them. Healthy. Like it, it is. It, there's oh, something time, yeah. that it does to you that it calms you down. You and I and will be sitting out there for hours. We, we all like literally just chickens. go and yeah. sit our lawn chairs down yeah. and, you know, just sit back and watch the chickens on the grass. And it, I don't know, there's this, you've got to yes. enjoy it that, so that it, 
makes it worth it. Because if I didn't enjoy the chickens, I can tell you very much, very, like I would not have them. Yeah. I, I wouldn't put the effort in it. I'm but... pretty well certifiably crazy, I guess. Like I've, I've had conversations with every animal on this farm and they're <laughs> not talking back. I You're know. just having conversations and you know, it's peaceful, like to go out and watch yeah. the cows or, you know, even the horses are, are excellent to watch. They're hilarious most of the time. But, um, you know, they're, the animals are, are really calming. And it's yeah. unlike being around a group of people. Oh, being um, stuck in an office or yeah. in a, an emergency room, you know, working. It, it, yeah. It's very different. Yeah. But, so we have a couple of comments here. Oh, okay. So one in regards to uh, you need to get your side-by-side -side fix. So. Yeah. Uh, Matt Smith says he knows a guy who needs a quad fix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt, Matt's, uh, Matt's in the same boat as me. He, he put his bad juju on me today. <laughs> his, his battery and his quads all messed up. And uh, I think he talked to, it, talked to me so much about it. My quad battery decided to die today. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Dana has a comment. Uh, the work put into raising those animals equals high quality in the end. It does. We do it yeah. the same way better for the animals and for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Dave Knight says, look, looking forward to seeing Rob wrench and old farm equipment. <laughs> uh, Dana has a comments. Uh, I really appreciate, I really appreciate this interaction with you folks. I have no one in my circles who do what I do nor understand why I do uh. it. Oh, Dave, well, we're sorry, Dana. Dana, yeah, yeah. Dana, we're we talk about that all the time. Like, we, uh, I'm sure our friends think we're crazy. They oh, do they think we're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Family, yeah. yeah, they won't even come from an hour away. No, the first yeah. time some of our friends came up here, I won't name names, they came up and they went, they had a face like, what, why would you do that? And, and, and to me, I just thought, yeah, you know what, you're never gonna get it. Yeah. And and that's fine. Well, we've been up here six, seven years. Yeah. Jay? Uh, this is our seventh winter. 2016, anyways. Winter. And I can tell you that we have had maybe my mother's been up yeah. twice. And my brother went out, came up once to look at our furnace. And I, we've had no other really relatives other than your parents. Yeah. What, like, we, you know, no people yeah. like they just don't understand the lifestyle that we choose to live. So we, we, we definitely feel you. And, you know, we're so happy, Dana, that you are oh, part time, of this yeah. circle because it, without having a community or a group of people that understand where you're coming from, it can be a really hard lifestyle. Nobody else understands things like mm -hmm. you said better than somebody else doing yes, it. This that's is right. honestly like a whole topic on its own. I think we can talk about it next week, Dana, and in big time. I was actually down in Golden Lake like today. So we're not far, but we'll have to get together at some point because it's so good to be connected with other is, people yeah. in the community. Because there's questions that I can't ask anyone in our social circle because they don't know the answer to why my pigs did this or why my garden's doing that and nor do they think that's sane sometimes but this community everybody here is really helpful like we bounce ideas off of you guys yeah. all my garlic's planted off based off kendra's knowledge and um we talk to our neighbors all the time on issues we're having with livestock or calves or whatever and um i'm so glad that we built a community like that mm -hmm. in this and these videos on um the youtube live series that all the other guys that do it kind of the ones that you guys have been yeah. dealing with you know you know, Tehan one for one and um, Thorhaven and Mike and Angie up at Menu Acres mm -hmm. and these guys, they're so beneficial to us oh, yeah. learning and learning and making less mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's been really important to Yeah, to even, yeah, even having that that YouTube Canadian YouTube homesteading um, yeah. circle has been has been really helpful. You know, just getting by and knowing that there's other people out here doing it and trying to make it work, you know, and especially like moving up here with the whole gardening thing we came from um a zone five now like a i don't know if it's zone 4b or what we are but um there was a, a bit of an adjustment and we're like well i don't know what to do well i relied on one of our neighbors and um she was telling me you know well you can't really grow this type of tomato up here it takes too long i wouldn't have had a clue 
you know, so yeah. you do, we rely heavily on the knowledge that we can share as a group and a community. Oh, big time. Yeah. And most of like, you know, some of the stuff that, um, that you see out there, it's been so helpful in terms of saving those experiences, like shared experiences with chickens you know, losing, you know, predators, the predators one we did yeah. was, was really important to me because it was stuff that I didn't think about before we started. All of those things really benefit and help aid you in making less mistakes. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, I know this might not really be part of the topic, but I remember um, when we were, I, we were selling some of our eggs to some of our customers and I couldn't believe it, but the these customers, like they had no idea how they knew that the eggs weren't going to have chicks in them. Yeah. You know, like they, and there was nothing, you know, it's not like a funny thing or anything. It kind of is, but they had no clue the fact that, well, you're, you're going to need to, it needs to be incubated. It needs to be heated for a length yeah. of time. They're like, well, how did, how does the egg get fertilized? Like, does the rooster have to sit on it? And, you know, so just having like these talks and discussions, can make somebody not necessarily have to ask that awkward question yeah. that makes them feel stupid, but just yeah. being us being able to sit here and talk about it can, can help somebody else be like, Oh, that's what it meant. So it's just really our whole goal of doing these lives is trying to help the people out there that were like us in the yeah. beginning, didn't have a clue what they were doing and didn't know who to ask, but we want to like kind of answer all those questions and even if we don't know it, like we're hoping that maybe we can find out where to get to know the knowledge or learn from you guys. So um, this is the whole purpose we're here. Oh, big time. <laughs> this, uh, this is why we do YouTube. <laughs> Four years ago, I could hardly tell the difference between hay and straw. Yeah. And now I'm into forage analysis and <laughs> you know, like and grazing, grazing yeah. techniques. No, and stalking and, like all this other crazy stuff. Yeah. The, and I thought a cow was a cow. I didn't know what... There was, you know, heifers and whatever. I, I, I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. You know, same as uh, with pigs and stuff. It was all new terminology. That that's kind of interesting because uh, your your uh, father uh, was a butcher by yeah. trade, eh? And so those terms you didn't even. It was just a cow or a pig type of thing. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of the same with us with chickens, though. When when I visited farms with dad or whatever, when I seen animals growing up, like things were dying and we were butchering it was yeah. i didn't know yeah. the yeah, front end true. i didn't that's know the true. front end right i knew the back end and that was it i knew how to what the butcher cuts were what things were looking like and i'm nowhere near done learning that i still have so much to learn from those guys but enough so that like we have beef jerky in the dehydrator right now and that's from learning from them but that's firsthand experience knowledge and uh you know their generation doesn't do youtube we're mm -hmm. fortunate enough to have that now. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So Matt Smith has a, a tip on what not to do on the homestead. Whatever you do, don't try and make money <laughs> off maple syrup. No. No. Do you know how many people automatically assume that we do maple syrup? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but in conversation, what was it? Yesterday, we asked twice? Twice. Twi yesterday, twice, we were at a uh, um, Addington Highlands tourism um, event. Which was really good. I would have, I would have loved to have seen a lot more people come out because oh. there's some really good, uh, um, some good knowledge sharing opportunities like that. Um, and we met with uh, some local local businesses that are involved in the tourism industry. Um, so it was beneficial. But they asked, "Oh, so you start maple syrup?" <laughs> and like, I didn't want to say I'm too lazy to do maple syrup. So I just said, "Oh no, we don't do maple syrup." But really, it's that's a lot of work. That's a huge undertaking. Like hats off to Matt and Jess. Uh, Matt and Jess are off grid, and wow. he's doing doing maple syrup. And I think he's crazy. I'll probably yeah, I'm I gonna wanna, I'm gonna let him. Uh, his comment because uh, this ties into the crazy. It's only crazy. Uh, so Dana says it's only crazy, Rob. If a doctor says it is, stay away from the doctors, and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, they got and me. Yeah, Rob's already yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, we're through again and again. Yeah. Matt, Matt, and just there uh, that are on there. I'm, they're down the road from you guys, but I'm gonna give him a few days uh, helping him do syrup. Um, oh, nice. So I'll, I'll see if he'll let me video for you guys to show uh, his operation. I'm sure it's gonna be good. 
because his luck is just like mine. It sounds like everything he touches breaks, just similar to me. So there'll probably be some we good did videos. We do maple syrup once, and I I keep saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna try it again this year, and I'm like, eh. it's it's a lot of we, work. We don't we only have a couple maple trees, so it's it yeah. we don't get a lot. It's a might, nice treat though. It I is mean, a nice yeah. thing to do. If, if you're only doing it really for yourself, yeah, you know it's not yeah. That bad. Yeah. Um, Dana says, I do maple syrup every year. It's one of the easier things I do here. Nice. Uh, if you got a good setup, it probably yeah. is. Uh, yeah. That's great. See, she's do he's doing something. I'm sorry. I have yeah. friends named Dana and I can't separate. <laughs> well, that's because Dana, that's because there's a I'm, thinking... I'm surprised Dana even came back to this live. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave you. That's because there's no, sorry, I'm... Okay. Can I'm... Skull, just think skull, guy. Yeah. That's it. Well, we need to we need to get teed up with him no. though. I would like to, to meet face. him. I want to meet yeah. you, we... and it'll stay. Okay, that's it. so that's what we're gonna you have need to, to do. You, we need to get him down to the homesteading yes, conference. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna get you down to the homesteading conference. We'll meet up, and I I did find some devil's ear lettuce, and I'm gonna get you some. <laughs> So we need to meet up because I need to put a picture to the what name. What is Devil's Ears lettuce? Oh, that, we'll ask you that later. We're <laughs> that, it's my favorite lettuce. <laughs> yeah, here's some Devil's Ear lettuce in your salad. Like, salad's bad enough. I don't need so devil involved in it. some good news for you there, yeah. Kendra. So Dana says it takes a lot more than that to hurt my feelings, Kendra. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyways. Yeah. Well, oh. I hope I hope we kind of... Dana I, is going to perfect oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> I'm, I'm i think that's going to be a good conference too for anybody that's watching the, the youtube yes. live it's eastern ontario homesteader conference jenny and kendra went down last year mm -hmm. got a lot of good info met a lot of good people sh a lot of shared experiences um i'm good. excited to go down this year we're going to be doing a topic talking about um reviving a homestead and it'll be based on uh, us talking about using the cattle and the pigs and the chickens to revive your pastures and your land, um, you know, uh, through regenerative practices and how that was more effective and cost effective for us than using a tractor um, mm -hmm. in most cases. So we're, we're going to talk about that. I think that'll be a good one. There's a lot of other good topics at that conference I'm excited to learn about. So uh, for anybody nice. looking, that's probably a good spot to do it. And I think now's the time to get into homesteading because I'm looking at the prices and stuff. Uh, prices on Homes haven't dropped at all. Yeah. Anything with acreage is climbing. And wow. uh, I think now's the time to go. If anybody's on the fence, uh, now is the time to get into it, especially when food yeah. prices get higher. Yeah. People are looking for more acreage, and uh, and that trend is not going away from what I see. And that's the thing. Like, yeah. with everything going up like that, um, the, the, the cost of living going up, your 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 price. What is it? Your your income is not being increased. Like no. people are still making the same the amount of money. Of yeah. Well, people are yeah. still out there working for the same um, wage, wage that yeah. they have been making for years, and that's not going up. Yeah, so, like uh, yeah. Matt Smith says, you make about five cents an hour doing doing maple syrup his way. So yeah, it's not it's not it's going not. anywhere. So no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I it's a good that... trade. I, I know a guy that'll trade you some stuff for that maple syrup as long as he doesn't have to do a whole pile of work. So. <laughs> yeah. Just well, not bacon. Yeah. No, Just no bacon. bacon. <laughs> no trade for bacon. It's no bacon. This farm doesn't sell bacon anymore. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But anyways, we, we better we better wrap it up though. Yeah. I hope I hope some uh, there's some good numbers that I threw out to give you an idea of stuff and Kendra brought some good topics and. Uh, Hopefully um, that helps you guys with uh, chickens, pigs, cattle, or those goats. Um, get away from goats. <laughs> get away from goats. <laughs> yeah. Good night, guys. Thank you. Take care.